What legacy are you leaving for the next generation? Uh, what are you passing on that will make uh, people that will outlive you, their lives better, richer, and deeper? American novelist Stephen King came, uh, faced that question head on when he was uh, lying in a ditch, stru- having been struck by a drunk driver. As his life went in front of him, he realized that the only thing that you can leave to the next generation can't be tangible. Um, So imagine for a moment that you are standing at your own memorial service. Maybe you're off against the wall. Nobody can see you. Your family's in the front row staring blankly. They're choking back tears. Uh, Your friends have gathered and they're all talking about you. What are they saying? One thing's for certain, they're not talking about your financial portfolio. The only thing you can leave uh, beyond you that's of any value cannot be tangible. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a a guide, uh, maybe a checklist we can follow of how to uh, live well, how to love well, to pass on to the next generation, to those who will come behind us? The good news is there is such a list. Uh, It's written not just by a brilliant man in the first century, but it's inspired by God himself and preserved in his word. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is the most well-known passage in the Bible about love. But Romans 12, 9 to 21 is a close second. Paul teaches us how to love in practical ways. So if you have your Bible... Uh, turn to Romans 12, 9 to 21. If you want to use one of the Bibles we have under the seats, it's on page 1,137. One, yeah, page 1,137. So let me review a little bit where we've been. We've been looking at the book of Romans. Paul uh, starts off and he says, all of us can know that there's a God. One is just by looking outside at how beautiful things are and how the universe works so well. There has to be a designer behind that. The second way he says we can know there's a God is because all people tend to judge other people. Where does that come from? A naturalistic world without a God doesn't make any sense why people around the world feel this cry for justice. And they they scream out at things that seem to be unjust. Where does that come from? Well, Paul says... The reason for that is that God has written His moral law on the heart of every human being that's in this world. That's why we naturally know the difference between just and unjust, right and wrong. And the best way to explain that is that there's a God behind that. Then he talks about the fact that we, even though we can know there's a God, we tend to ignore Him. We turn our backs to Him. We sin against Him. And so we fall short of his glory. So God sees us and he sends his son to die for our sins. He shows his grace to us so we can have a restored relationship with him and be forgiven. If we give our lives to Christ, then he gives us his Holy Spirit to live within us and to begin to make us new people, people that want to follow Christ. Then in chapters 12 to 16, He talks about the practical implications of being a follower of Christ. Last week we saw that the basis for all that we do in life is God's mercy. God has been merciful to us, so we want to serve Him. We want to be merciful to other people. And now here in Romans 12, 9 to 21, because of God's mercy, we want to love other people. So... Let's stand in honor of God's Word, and would you read with me Romans 12, 9 to 21? As, as we read these verses, just let them sink over you, the, the, uh, the instructions, how we can live well and, ha- and love well. Maybe you can just kind of do a, a mental checklist. How am I doing on that one? Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. 
Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people. <clears throat> you pay evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Lord God, thank you for giving us these uh, guidelines for how we can live well, how we can love well. We want to live that way, but these are hard. Some of them are very difficult. Show us how we're ready to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I count no less than 17 instructions in those verses. I can't possibly talk to you about 17 17 things this morning. So I've grouped them into five practical suggestions of how we can love others and how we can live well. Um, We all need, uh, whether we're seniors, empty nesters, uh, married, single, a teenager, we need to learn how to love well. Uh, If you're not a Christian, maybe you've run into somebody who claimed to be a Christian who did not love you. But I can assure you, we are to love others. That is the the, the goal that all Christians aspire to. A parent showing your child how to love is one of the highest things you can do in serving them. So let's look at five ways that we can love others and live well to leave a legacy after us. Number one. Be devoted in, to one another in love. Verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Uh, God's been merciful to us, so we want to love others. Uh, true love is sincere. It hates what is evil. It clings to what is good. It honors others. And it causes us to be devoted to one another. Johnny and Marty were best boyhood friends. Uh, They played baseball together, and they made a pact that they would always play together. And uh, they went through Little League together, then into high school, and uh, Johnny was the star. He was the star of the team. He was uh, voted the number one baseball player in in Georgia his senior year. Uh, He was the talk of Atlanta. And his coach pulled him aside one day, and he says, you know, tryouts are coming for the majors It'd be one of the minor league teams that feeds into the majors, and you should try out. He says, great, I'll tell Marty. We'll be there. And he says, ah, forget about Marty. He's too slow. He's too skinny. Well, Johnny told Marty's mom about the tryouts and that he and Marty were going to try out together. And she says, ah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about Marty. I know, you know, he'll get cut. You'll make the team. And... uh but, you know, Johnny was insistent. So they both tried out, and sure enough, Johnny made the team, and Marty got cut. But he said to the coach, it's both of us or none of us. We come together as a, as a, as a twosome. And the coach couldn't believe it, and uh, so Johnny left camp, and the coach thought, man, this guy is so loyal. So he ended up giving them both contracts. And uh, they came up, you know, through the the, the minor league system, and um, uh, Marty was inspired by Johnny's confidence in him, so he learned to hit better and feel better, and he got better and better. Their third year, Johnny washed out, but Marty kept hitting better and getting better, and he was called up to the St. Louis Cardinals, and uh, he became part of a 1940s dynasty called the Gas House Gang. And in 1944, when the Cardinals won the World Series, Marty Marion was named the most valuable player. 
A few years later, uh, Marty's mom was talking to John. He says, why did you stick with him so faithfully? He says, he was my best friend. I love him. He was devoted to him. Number two, be a one buttock servant. If this image seems like TMI, just hear me out. This is verse 11. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. The, the word Paul uses for fervor is, is the word like for boiling water or metal that's white hot. Uh, serving the Lord isn't something we do out of duty, but it's something we do with passion out of gratefulness for God's mercy to us. Um, Benjamin Zander was the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra. He also was a professor at the New England School of Conservatory, music school. And one of his students was playing a, a Chopin piece on the piano, and he knew the piece very well, um, but somehow it just kind of remained earthbound. And uh, Benjamin couldn't understand it because this, this is like his finest uh, student and uh, he knew that he understood the piece. He could teach anybody all about what it was about. But it, it just didn't have that thing that music needs. And he was watching him. This is in a master's class. And there are lots of guests there. And he said, that's it. And he just kind of yelled out, you know, you're just sitting upright on the piano bench. He says, you have to become a one buttock player. You have to move with the music. Let it just kind of fill you and you go with it. And as he began to do that, the song came alive. And one person that was in the audience that day sent Benjamin a letter two days later. And he says, I was so inspired by what happened that I went home and I decided I would make my company a one buttock company. That's the way we're supposed to serve during the week. Between Sundays, we serve people with passion. Because God has been so good to us, we want to help other people. I've heard this story uh, two or three times at conferences, and uh, I told you last Sunday that uh, this comes from Danny Meyer, who was one of the speakers at uh, Leadership Summit this summer. He's a, he owns and operates about 12 restaurants in New York City. And this gal uh, came for lunch to Tabla. That's uh, his restaurant that serves Indian food. And uh, she was all flustered because she'd left her wallet in the taxi. And... Um, the maitre d' said, hey, no problem. We'll extend you credit. Don't worry about it. And you just be seated with your friend. And, and so they sat down to lunch. And Danny heard about this. And so he got the manager involved. He says, listen, this girl is going to tell lots of people that she left her wallet uh, in the taxi as she came into Tabla. And so he, he didn't give him any specific directions. But the manager knew what he meant. And so he went to the table and he said, now, did you leave your phone in the car too? And she says, yes. And so he began calling her phone number. And nobody answered. He called for 30 minutes and uh, just kept calling over and over again. And finally, the, the cab driver answered. And now he was way uptown in the Bronx. And so they sent a staffer up there to retrieve the, the, the wallet and phone and, uh, and had it back. And they, they gave it back to her as they were presenting her the check at the end of the meal. She was so flabbergasted and amazed uh, Danny says it cost them $31 for that cab ride to retrieve it. But he says, I'll bet that gal has repaid us a hundred times over in telling what we did for her that day at the restaurant. That's one buttock passionate service. And that's what God calls all of us to do all week long. Three, be patient through difficulties. Verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in in prayer. When you love someone, there's no limit to what you can endure. What keeps you going? Your Christian hope. You may be suffering difficult times right now, but you know that life is going to go on for eternity. You'll be with Christ someday in heaven, and that gives you patience to go through what you're facing today. And all the while you pray, you pray that God will give you the strength to serve other people. He'll give you the strength to love people in your family or your school or your place of work. When you're facing dark days, the last thing you want to relinquish is your time in prayer. That's your lifeline. 
You pray for strength to love the people in your life. Four, be generous and kind to all people in need. Verse 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Uh, We show love to people that are in need. Love is not stingy. Every year at Christmas, uh, we take a Christmas offering. Uh, This is giving in addition to what we regularly give, and it's for people that are in need. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. In Greek and Roman culture at the time when Paul wrote this, if uh, you were seen with people of much lower rank, it could be devastating to your social status. But Paul says, to the contrary, we're to be humble and seek out people on the fringes. Meeting the needs of the poor and those who are struggling has always been one of the hallmarks of Christians. Be devoted to one another. Be a one buttock servant. Be patient in difficulties. Be generous and kind to all people in need. And finally, do right when you've been done wrong. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You say, obviously, the Apostle Paul didn't know the person who's made life so terribly difficult for you. But the Apostle Paul faced more suffering than anybody else uh, in his time. So when Paul says, bless those who persecute you, he knew what he was talking about. Then in verse 17, he writes some very difficult verses for us to live out. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. We're supposed to, when we love others, we're supposed to live at peace with everyone. How? Paul suggests two responses. One is passive and one is active. Passively, when an enemy deliberately harms us, we're to let it go unanswered. Paul says when somebody says something or does something cruel to you, let it go. Note the reason we're to set aside our revenge. Verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Uh, When I first read this, I I took it to mean something like this. When somebody hurts you, leave it to God to take vengeance on them because he can do a lot more harm than I can. But that's not the way God works. He doesn't ever, his his wrath is never spiteful or retaliatory. Uh, God's, his his punishment is always redemptive. All of us have deep natural instincts within us. Every cell in our bodies is programmed for survival. Uh, When something comes too close to our face, we flinch. Uh, When we uh, are about to fall, we put out our hands. Um, When we're in our car and a car starts backing up towards us, we honk. Those are natural instinctive responses. Uh, When someone causes us harm, our natural instinct is to seek justice, to get even. But Paul calls us to respond supernaturally, not just to use our natural response. After suffering uh, some suffering from some harmful deed from someone else, we need healing. And vengeance whispers a tantalizing promise. Getting even will heal that emotional wound in you And you'll feel warm all over. But it's not true. It's a lie. Revenge cannot heal wounds. Only grace can. Grace in the form of a heartfelt repentance uh, and a sincere apology will go a long ways. But offenders seldom will take the risk of humbling, humbling themselves to ask forgiveness. But God's grace is in abundant supply. Just for the asking. So instead of giving retribution, give grace. When we take our own revenge, we dare to stand between ourselves or between God and the person who wronged us. God wants to use that experience to bring them to repentance. But if we take vengeance into our own hand, it's like we're 
replacing God as the, as the judge over the world. Paul's next suggestion is more active. Verse 20, On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. We're to extend our enemies the same hospitality we would to anybody else in our lives. Uh, We're not to return evil for evil. Evil always stirs up more evil. Refuse to use our natural reaction. This is not a proof text for pacifism. Paul isn't writing about the foreign policy of a nation. Uh, These are uh, guidelines for individuals who find themselves the target of evil deeds. Uh, Paul doesn't condemn us using our common sense to defend ourselves or our family. If, If somebody breaks into your house in the middle of the night, you don't say, hey, don't forget our computer room. You know, or don't check out the, 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 the you know, media room. We've got a lot of good electronics in there. No, you fight. You call the police. Paul does not intend this to pro- prohibit us from defending our wife or our family or our home. Rather, this is, he's talking about heated arguments or silly lawsuits, uh, deliberate slander, dirty politics at, at school or at work. It's okay to protect yourself. However, there's a fine line between protection and retaliation. Our best policy is to look for ways to be kind to an enemy and only to survive an immediate danger to life. Returning a good for evil is not a complicated concept. It's really pretty simple. However, it's one of the most difficult tasks we'll ever undertake in this world. Let's be honest, forgiving an offense is easier when our uh, offender comes to us and asks for forgiveness. But they seldom do that. So we have to learn to extend grace even when they haven't apologized. Kindness is a response beyond our natural ability. It calls for God's supernatural ability. But that's precisely what God gives us. If you've given your life to Christ, He's given you His Holy Spirit. It's the same power in you that He used when He raised Christ from the dead. You have that much power. Kristen, come on up here. This is Kristen Hayward. Uh, Kristen uh, was part of our team that uh, called Micah to serve in our church. She uh, cooks once a month for the youth on Sunday nights, and she is one of the writers of our journal. You guys are doing a great job, and uh, you did this one. Our family did it last night. Uh, Very good questions. So you have a story. Share it. I was just turning to my husband, and I said, oh, my gosh, I'd rather stand up in front of 1,000 people I don't know than 50 people I do. (laughs) So um, uh, I, as I was writing this journal, um, something that happened in my own life kind of kept coming front and center. And uh, so I'm going to tell you an eight-year story in about three minutes. Um, 2010, I was transferred. I'm a teacher. My principal was transferred to a new school, and she took me with her, um, which I was thrilled for. It was a great school. It was a great job. And um, it was a full-time job, which is something we'd been praying for as uh, we had some unemployment in our world. Um, But I had no idea uh, when I walked in on the first day of school that my first year there was going to be so miserable. Um, One of my colleagues was not so happy that I had been transferred there. Um, She found me a threat for some reason. I hadn't known her. uh, At least I didn't know I had known her before that point. And um, she uh, was awful um, the first year. She made nasty comments to my face, behind my back. Um, found every possible way to make my life miserable. Um, the bad thing was is that we sat in the same department and oftentimes were on the same committees. At the end of that school year, um, we both applied for a job that was um, in high desire in our building, and I got the job. Um, so the next year was even worse. Uh, but knowing that I was going to be sitting on all these committees with her, I decided I had to do something to make life at least bearable. So I um, was polite. I didn't go out of my way to talk to her, but I at least was polite um, in when we were in the same um, space as each other. Um, After a couple of years of doing this, one of my colleagues came to me and said, I need you to go get some paperwork signed 
um, by her because you're her friend, right? And uh, I <laughs> kind of laughed. I thought, well, I've been putting on a really good front. Um, but decided at that point, we, it had to not be a front anymore. I had to really, truly attempt to be her friend because there was no end in our working relationship in sight. So um, that next year, I made an effort to talk to her, ask her questions about her family, listen when she was talking at the table, um, and it, things got better. Um, summer of 2016, we were both sitting in a meeting together, uh, and she stopped me as we were walking in that day and said, I need a few minutes of your time during our first break. I was a little worried about what was going to come out of her mouth um, as we headed into the next school year, but um, what she told me uh, kind of shocked me. She told me that she had just been diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer and she was going to need my help. Um, so we end, went into the school year, and about a month later, she came back to me and said, it's worse than they thought, it's stage four, I'm gonna have to have double mastectomy, I'm gonna have to have radiation, I'm gonna have to have chemotherapy, I, I really need your help. Um, so over the next year, I spent a lot of time at her house, I took her meals, went walks with her uh, while she was uh, recovering and going through her chemotherapy. And um, while she has, she's still in remission, I mean, she's on the path to recovery, um, later, or this last year, uh, we happened to run into each other outside of school, and she turned to the person that she was with and told her that I was her work best friend, which is a far cry from where we started eight years ago. Um, this year, we actually have, we sat down at the beginning of the year and tried to figure out when we could eat lunches together and um, have made an effort, we, like we talk during the school day, and I truly could call her my friend now, which I definitely could not have done two or three years ago. So, that was it. Great job. <clears throat> we're proud of you, Kristen. She's a great example of what we're talking about here. Very difficult verses, uh, not repaying evil for evil, but loving them. If we want to leave a legacy for people who outlive us, then we need to show them a life of love, for we are to love one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these uh, verses that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write. We want to live them. We want to live well and love well and leave an example for those who will follow us. And so help us to do these. these are, some of these are very difficult verses to do. Thank you for Kristen. Uh, may we live like her. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to pray right now and uh, tell God you want to live this way. Uh, if you've never given your life to Christ, you can invite him into your life right now and say, I want you to come into my life, your Holy Spirit to come in and begin to work on me on the inside. Uh, but all of us, tell him what you heard today and Maybe you've got somebody in your life you need to forgive and you need to treat uh, kindly uh, instead of with uh, anger or hatred. You pray that right now. Lord God, thank, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for showing us love even when we weren't loving you. And now help us to do that for others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.